Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on this video. Today we speak about Full Metal Update, the WTQ's over the year update solution. And your host today for speaking about that is Cédric Vincent and Antonin Godard. Hi guys. Hi there. Hi. Can you please introduce yourself before we start? Sure, I'm Cédric Vincent, Director of Technology at WTQ. My daily job is for WTQ and make sure that uh, we always stay ahead of the curve. My name is Antonin Godard, and I'm an embedded software engineer at WTQ, and I work on a lot of different subjects, including Full Metal Update. Perfect. Thanks, guys. WTQ is an embedded software company expert, uh, an IoT company as well, uh, with 18 years in embedded and IoT software, more than 135 WTQs around the world, in five offices uh, between Europe and also America. We have more than 100 customers per year and the blue chip customer leaders in their field. Um, this video will be in three parts. The number one is full Metal Update presentation by Cedric. The number two is OS and containers roadback presented by Antona. And the third part is AJI presented by Cedric. Thank you, Yanis, for the introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about Full Metal Update, a product that has been developed by VTQ uh, for the last couple of years. But first, why Full Metal Update? Because you might wonder, I mean, there are plenty of solutions for update over the year already available on the market. Uh, I can talk about Mender, Balena, and you can use solutions that, has, that have been developed by Microsoft as well to achieve uh, that type of goals. But Full Metal Update has a couple of very unique features uh, that you will not find in any of those solutions. The first one is Delta Updates. So why Delta Updates? I mean, not all IoT devices are connected to the Wi-Fi or over 5G. So, which means that you might have a bandwidth which is very limited, or you might even need to pay for the bandwidth. So, the ability just to uh, update the difference between two new versions of the software is very important for all those use cases. Then, full metal update is based on containers because they, they, they manage to solve a lot of issues when it comes to dependencies. And since we're going to talk about AGI, and if you are already practicing AGI or just machine learning whatsoever, you know that dependencies are a huge issue because you've got plenty of versions of TensorFlow and from one version to another, like quite often it's not even compatible. Adding to that, isolation. I mean, if you use containers, you've got like your application isolated from the rest of the system. From a security standpoint, it's always interesting. And using containers, it just makes it easy for you to use like C groups, namespace. So that's as well very interesting from a security standpoint. Then full metal update is power loss resistant. So if you use solution like Docker to update your system, Docker were designed for servers with power backup. And that's not applicable to embedded system. So when you are updating something uh, like one of your devices, you need to make sure that even you, right, right in the middle of the update, that your device is gonna still start and you, you're gonna still be able to use it. So full metal update was designed for that. It was designed for that for the operating system and the containers. The operating system, the regular way to do that usually is to use like some tools like SW update and to have like AB partition in transit. But for full metal update, we are using a different type of tools, which is even more uh, powerful when it comes to that, because it's managing the delta updates and it's managing as well the atomicity of your update. Then full metal update, when you use the demo, comes with a feature that enables continuous delivery pipelines. So you get a build system that is going to build your application, build your embedded, like your embedded distribution, and 
deploy that automatically to a web UI that you can use to then deploy the new version of your software to your different devices. And it's fully integrated, it's already there. So day one, like you set up full metal update on your computer, you can have that. And I think that's a big plus of that solution as well. Then how full metal update? What type of technologies are we using in the background for full metal update? I mean, we did not develop that solution from scratch. It was mostly integration, basically. So the first part, the first technology that we used is Yocto. So Yocto is the go-to solution when it comes to develop embedded Linux distribution. It's a system based on scripts that you're going to develop either in Bash or in Python to, that you're going to use to assemble what's called VCPs. So layer of software that you put together to assemble your own Linux distribution. With that, we use RunC to uh, develop, uh, I mean, for you, to uh, generate the different containers where you're going to put your different applications. So it's a mix between RunC and Yocto. So Yocto is going to build the embedded Linux distribution, but Yocto is as well going to generate the different containers because Yocto is great for one thing is if you put, uh, for instance, a Qt application, what Yocto is going to do, it's going to look at, OK, you need Qt, and it's going to look at all the dependencies you need to build your Qt, you need to build Qt, and it's going to package that together inside a container. So as much as it can be used to, as well, generate the main operating system, it can be used as well to generate like a very, very uh, lightweight container just with a minimum set of dependencies to run your Another advantage uh, of RunC compared to Docker is it's super light. It's just the runtime to uh, run like the, the application that you have in your container. When Docker comes with a lot of layers that can manage updates as well. But as we already discussed, the way it's done is not power failure safe. And that's why we needed something else like, to replace that part of Docker. And what we use is OS3 to do that. So OS3 is a tool developed by Red Hat that basically is able to manage a data updates for you. Um, I can compare it to Git, so if you are familiar with it. But it's Git for binaries. So basically, you're going to push that version A of your application to kind of a Git repository. And when you put you push version B, OS3 is going to automatically uh, compute the differences between those two versions and only push those differences to the OS3 repository. Which means that when you're going to push that update to your new embedded devices, it's as well just the delta between the two versions that is going to be pushed by OS3. So, for instance, if you are updating, I don't know, an embedded Linux distribution of 200 megabytes, if you just change a file that was like 20 kilobytes, OS3 is just going to do all the magic in the background for you and just update those 20 kilobytes. Then the last part of the project is Orbit. Because, I mean, you've got a cool solution to generate your embedded Linux distribution, to generate containers with your application, a way to deploy those applications and this embedded Linux distribution to your embedded targets. But you need a way to control how you're going to update all those devices. And Hobbit was just developed for, for that. Basically, it, it was developed by a Bosch to manage all like type of IoT devices that they are using for, I guess, their infrastructure for their customers. So we use that technology, which is open source as well, and we integrated that to FullMetal Update. So when you are done with this setting up FullMetal Update, basically, from the beginning, you get a build system that was set up in containers, so in Docker containers, that you can easily set up on your computer. You get the server side with OS3, so to deploy easily everything, and how big, how big to manage that. So if we look at the architecture of that system, how is it, uh, how is it set up? So on the left of that slide, you see you've got the build farm. So the build farm is where you're going to build your different Linux distribution, your different applications that you're going to put in containers. All of that is going to be managed by Yocto. And when Yocto is done with building your embedded distribution and your applications, everything is going to be 
committed to OS3. Why I'm using committed is just, again, to do the parallel between Git and OS3. So it's not pushed, if you are familiar with Git, it's committed, which means that it has been kind of uh, pushed locally, so pushed on your computer. Then, automatically, the script which is running with Yocto is going to push that to the OS3 server. So this, this OS3 server is running in the cloud. If you use our demo, it's going to be running on your computer, as you can see, Docker Compose. So automatically, every time you generate a new version of the embedded Linux distribution that you want to use on your device, or a new version of the application that you want to push to the device, OS3 is going to generate all the Delta updates that you need to update those devices that are on the right side. Then Yoke 2 is going to do something else. It's going to automatically push all the information about those new versions to Hogbit. So automatically, every time you build the new version of an embedded Linux distribution or container, you're going to see that popping out in the UI, uh, in the Hogbit UI. And then you can choose whenever you want to deploy those new versions. And what's great, we can manage as well, uh, like, um, bulk updates. So you can decide, like, for, I don't know, you've got like 1,000 devices, and, but you want just to update 50 devices, like, that's going to be your canary devices, basically, just to test the new update, the new version of your software, and then to update the rest. Another cool system that you have with Hogbit, if, if it starts to go wrong, you can have, like, a kind of automated way for Hogbit to decide, okay, that's not working. Like, your, my, this new version is not running very well at the moment. Automatically trigger a rollback for all those devices. On the right uh, side of the side deck, you can see so what's happening on the embedded systems. So basically, you've got a client for FAU. This client is going to do the polling on the server. So it's not the server deciding when uh, you're going to update. It's the client which is going to do the polling, I don't know, every 30 seconds, every 20 minutes. It's something you can actually set up. And when it's going to detect that there is a new version, it's going to automatically use OS3 to download that new version. And if it's a new version for the operating system, it's going to, when it's updated, restart the operating system. If it's a new version of an application running in the container, it's just going to update the container and restart the container which is another big plus of full metal update. You don't need to restart the whole operating system every time you've got an update. If you use the AV partitioning, for instance, you don't really have a choice. But with full metal update and with OS3, with that combo of applications, you instead just need to restart the part you just updated, basically. Then you might wonder, what about the security level of full metal update? Well, you've got everything. You've got everything to build a secure system. But nothing is set up by default. Why? Why that? <laughs> it's very simple. Right? Because depending on what you want to secure, if it's a water tank or if it's a safe, you're not going to apply the same level of security and you're not going to invest this. And at VTQ, we don't believe there is a, such a thing as generic security. You can have good practices. But you don't have anything generic, something that you can deploy everywhere and say it's going to be safe for everybody. If you look at systems like, if you know Uptain, for instance, for automotive system, Uptain is great. I mean, that's the state of the art of what you can apply for security. But do you want that for a sensor that is going to be, I don't know, in a swimming pool, then just send, to send some water temperature? No. And it's going to be way too expensive. So, Instead of trying to put something kind of generic that could be used everywhere, we decided to have everything set up for you uh, that you can enable secure boot, that you can improve the file system, uh, where you put your certificates, for instance. So you've got everything ready for that. But nothing is enabled by default. It's up to you to do it. And then you can just do it to the level you need for the product that you are developing. Then there was one more, one, another additional feature that was missing to full metal update. It was the rollback. So, and that, that was just for us, just the time to develop it basically. And now we have it. So, Antona, my colleague, is going to present you what we mean by rollback. Because we already had kind of rollback. In, ca in case of a power failure, basically, OS3 was already managing that properly for us. Like, if 
the update is not complete uh, automatically, OS3 is just going to roll back to the last version that was ran. But you can have as well the case where you actually updated your system, but your application is not working properly, or your kernel is not even starting anymore. And this, you need a different system to manage. Uh, but it's what was implemented. So, Antonin, I leave you the, the stage. Uh, go ahead, you can start your presentation. So, thank you, Cedric, for this introduction to Full Metal Update. Now, we will focus on the operating system and container rollbacking. So, what do we mean by rollbacking? A rollback is just a return to a prior state by undoing some operation. And what that implies in our specific case is automatic error detection. And this is very important in the case of um, edge computing and in the case of um, embedded systems. And this rollback applies to the operating system and the containers. But one very important point is that the, these are two different solutions. So we will first uh, explain how the operating system rollbacking works and then how the container rollbacking works. So how uh, we, we need to focus on how the, the embedded system is booting uh, to focus on the rollback. So we have basically four stages. The first one being the bootloader, uh, which is uBoot. Then the execution is passed to the kernel. Then a script is ex executed. It is a custom script uh, by OS3 and, is, and it's used to uh, uh, mount the file system which represents the current deployment. And then finally, systemd is executed and uh, all system services are uh, started, including the full metal update client. And this is very important. The full metal update client is actually a systemd service. So we have to make two hypotheses uh, on this boot sequence. And we need to determine what is a success and what is a failure. So if the system boots from uh, U-boot up to the full metal update client startup, we will consider that uh, the boot is a success. Otherwise, if the boot process fails at any point, at any stage in the boot sequence, uh, so that may be the kernel, uh, the script or system D, we will consider the, the boot process as failed. And so in one more hypothesis is that uh, we want to trigger the rollback uh, when we have failed five times, because sometimes uh, the, the boot process will fail at some point, but the next boot uh, will, will run uh, fine, actually. So two hypotheses. We need to boot completely in order to consider the, the deployment as successful. If the deployment fails, if the boot fails at some point, we will consider it as a failure. And then if the boot fails five times, we need to roll back. So now we will see how we actually enable the rollback uh, with U-Boot. So uh, U-Boot has an environment uh, when starting, uh, and it, this environment contains variables that will be required by uh, OS3 to determine what to mount and to determine uh, on which kernel version and on which uh, deployment it will boot. So if we take a look, we have the boot command from uh, uBoot, just to use to, to boot. We have the boot arguments, which are uh, included in the kernel command line. We have the kernel image path, which is used to load the kernel from the file system. We have the initramfs path. And finally, event, you, you can optionally have a device tree path. And, but then OS3 uh, actually defines those variables from user space. So uh, it will define uh, the, some boot arguments needed, uh, which will uh, OS3 actually parse in order to know which deployment uh, it, will, it will use. And it will also define three variables, the, the kernel, RAM disk, and the device tree. But it will also define uh, um, a pair of variables for each of these which are named the variable with a two. And these variables actually represent the previous deployments. So if we decide to boot on the previous deployment, we will actually just need to use the green variables in order to boot. 
So let's see how we use this in order to enable the rollback. So it works with a simple algorithm because U boot actually allows for uh, logical operations, very simple logical operations. We will have two uh, additional variables that are defined by the full metal update clients and the full metal update clients on an update will uh, define success with the value of zero and trials with the value of zero. Success, as you may have guessed, represents the success of the current deployment. So by default, it is equal to zero. And trials represents the number of trials. We, we, the number of times we try to boot. So if we take a look at how the algorithm works, uh, basically uh, it will start, uh, U will start and parse his variables and OS3 variables are loaded. So the variables that are just defined right there. Then we will take a look at the value of success. If it equals one, that means that we already booted successfully because the client has uh, marked success at one. So then we will boot. But on an update, success equals zero. So we will go on the next uh, condition. Here we take a look at trials value. Uh, now trials equals to zero on an update. So we will take, we will go in this branch and we will actually increment trials. We will save this environment and then boot. Now let's make the hypothesis that the boot has failed. So the system reboots, we go on the script, success is still equal to zero and trials is incremented. So we just go in this branch again and we do that five times because the system, we make the hypothesis that the system fails five times. Here trails equals to five. So we go into the next branch, which is replacing all the main arguments used for booting by the second argument here, boot, args, boot arguments, the kernel, the RAM disk and device tree. And this will just uh, make, have, have for effect to boot on the previous deployment. Here we save the U-boot environment and we boot. And then we are sure that because this is, this is a previous deployment, we have very little chance that the system fails. So then when we actually reboot and we boot successfully, the client actually determines if the deployment has succeeded. So that is, we went uh, on the first or uh, in five boot trials, we actually succeeded. Then uh, the fundamental deployment uh, will feedback the server with a positive feedback. Otherwise, if we went into this branch, that means we, that we are on the previous deployment and then the client makes a negative feedback to the server. And that is very important because it's the only way for the user to know if the deployment, the operating system deployment has succeeded or not. So then let's go on explaining the container rollback. Uh, Containers are started with systemd, and systemd is actually very powerful in order to control the execution of processes. And systemd, sorry, systemd actually allows for uh, notify services, which allows for a fine-grained process monitoring. And basically, what systemd does is that it will execute the main process in in our case, uh, that's the container. It could be the container, and then systemd will wait for a flag from the container, uh, uh, a flag, which is actually sort of a message saying that the initialization has actually succeeded. And then we, we can consider the startup of the container as a success. So how can we roll back a container? First, we ex execute them with a notify service. That is, we just actually change the type of service to notify. And then we wait for an answer from the container and, and then if the container actually fails, which systemd handles, uh, systemd actually handles lots of different cases of failure, we roll back the container. So we will see uh, an example right now. Uh, this is just a sequence diagram uh, representing a success, an update scenario where the container actually su succeeds. So we have four parts, the client, the full metal update client, the Hogbit server, the container, and systemd. So first off, as Cedric uh, presented, we will, uh, enable, we will deploy uh, the update from Hogbit, sorry. We will deploy the update from Hogbit, and that is represented by the update query right there. Uh, then the full metal update client will feedback the server by saying that it is proceeding to the update. So the, uh, the update on the Hogbit server will be pending. 
then uh, the full meta update will help actually create a socket. And then it will create a thread, and this thread has the only purpose of waiting for a message in this socket. Then the full meta update client will update the container. And here we make the hypothesis that the container uh, successfully uh, initializes. The container will make a positive feedback to systemd. Systemd will actually execute a command to message the, the socket with this positive feedback. And the thread will receive uh, this feedback and will, will, it will use this feedback to feedback the server the status of the container. So here it is positive and it's actually very useful because again, the server is the only way for the user to know if the update actually succeeded. Then the client just proceeds to remove the sockets and proceed to other updates. And, and, and this scenario can actually repeat uh, exactly. So now let's see what happens when the container fails to boot. So here uh, we have the same steps uh, for beginning. So the update query, the socket creation, and the, uh, the thread waiting for a message. Then we proceed to the container update, but here uh, we make the hypothesis that the container just um, fails at some point during the initialization process. And systemd having a pretty fine delay will actually time out waiting for the message from the container. And systemd will actually decide that the container initialization has failed and message the socket with a negative, uh, with a negative feedback. The thread will receive the message and actually, we will first roll back the container because we know that the initialization has failed. And then we will uh, feedback the server with a negative feedback saying the status of the execution of the container. So that helps debugging. And then we will actually include uh, whether the container has successfully rolled back or not. And then again, this is very useful for the user on Orbit. Then we will just remove the socket and proceed to other updates. One very important point about this rollback is that uh, we actu you actually need to adapt your program in the container uh, in order to send a flag to systemd. But this is actually very simple because it's just one command sending the flag. And so finally, uh, we will see just what happens during a power outage as uh, Cedric previously mentioned. We just remind that OS3 updates are atomic. That means that we ultimately we will always boot on one version or another, that is the newest version or the previous version. So if the power goes down, the update will just, if the power goes down during an update, sorry, the update restarts and proceeds again. And one very interesting fact about OS3 is that if the data has already been downloaded, we, we don't actually need to redownload the data because it's already there. Uh, because it has already been downloaded uh, before the power outage. Now, let's see just the demo of how uh, Full Metal Update held, handles a power outage. For this first demo, we will demonstrate what happens when a power outage occurs during an update. So as you can see, this is the Hogbit user interface, and I have already configured the target, which is the STM32 MP1. I have two versions of the same container, the first version, version being the cat's version, and the second version being the cat's plus dog's version. Currently, my target is running the cat's version, and I'm going to deploy the cat's plus dog version and cut the current by pressing the reset button on the STM32. In parallel, I will just analyze what happens on the Fullmetal Update client by analyzing the log of systemd in the, in, on the target. So I'm going to deploy this version. As you can see, it's being added here in Hogbit. And now you can actually see that the client will start the update and I'm going to press the reset button right when it starts. So as you can see, it started the update and I cut the current. So the board is actually rebooting and it's going to follow its usual boot process. It's going to start systemd, which is going to start the system services, but it's also going to start the full metal update client. 
we will wait until the board successfully reboots and we will just see the log of the full metal update client so as you can see the client is going to restart and it's going to proceed to the update again and it's just going to proceed to the update normally it's going to download the data and actually proceed to update the container and in Hogbit you can actually see that the update is successful now in this case the data was redownloaded redown sorry because I cut the current before the data, the data was downloaded. If I don't, if I cut the current just after the, the data has been downloaded, that is right there. The data, this data, wouldn't have been redownloaded. OS3 would just have updated the container without having to redownload everything. So what we can conclude is that uh, whenever the power outage occurs, OS3 will manage to boot the container on either the previous deployment or the new deployment. Now let's talk about HAI and Cedric will talk about it. Thank you Antonin for that demonstration of the rollback feature. So the last part of that presentation is about HAI. But why HAI? What is HAI? So that's the three talking points you find everywhere. Latency, autonomous, autonomous driving. I mean, of course, if you send everything to the cloud and if you have to steer the wheels of a car, you might have some issue. Uh, when you are recording some videos, like people in the street, if you send all the data to the cloud, you might have some issue with privacy and bandwidth. Yeah, of course. Again, if you send like a video stream, like all the time to the cloud, uh, yeah, you pay for the data, so it might get quite expensive. By the way, that was the same talking point for edge computing. We kind of just changed the name. But that said, edge computing uh, has a couple of challenges that are really not that easy to solve. And we thought that full metal update actually uh, can help you to um, manage to solve a couple of those challenges. So in the cloud, if you look like overall, what are you gonna do when you do uh, AI, uh, like training of your models in the cloud? You're gonna need a data set for the training. So that's one of the main challenges actually when you are doing deep learning. You're gonna need to have training. And then you're gonna need a way to transfer those new networks to your edge devices. Because, I mean, the inference is something we can do at the edge, but the training, it's still for the cloud. Maybe at some point it's gonna change, but right now everything is still happening in the cloud. And you might be, you might see me coming with a pipeline to transfer the networks. Yeah, for metal of probably could do that. At the edge, uh, we've got two main challenges. I mean, it's the inference speed and can be the model size. I mean, if you are running on a microprocessor, it might not be an issue, but if you want to run your model on microcontroller, something that you might need to to optimize. One big point as well when you are running machine learning models uh, on edge devices is the dependency help. That's one of the biggest challenges you, you might run into. Uh, even with TensorFlow, from one version to another, they are not compatible. 1.4 to 2.0, not gonna work. Even from 2.0 to 2.1, you might have some issues. So that's a really interesting and it's where usually you need containers. Again, full metal update. We look as a, like the example uh, and uh, AGI. What do you want to do, uh, do when we talk about AGI? Basically, you want an asymmetric system. You want to have uh, on the edge the inference, so the ability to run a new classifier, for instance and in the cloud, the train. If I take an example with the coffee machine, smart coffee machine, which is going to be able, which is going to, be able to recognize uh, customers. So if it's a new customer, I'll be able to retrain the network in the cloud to add that customer and then to adapt the settings of the machine for that customer. And you are in front of the, 
you are in front of the coffee machine, and then uh, every morning you take a black coffee, no sugar. Would not be great if the coffee machine knows that for you, and automatically, every time you are in front of that coffee machine, it's uh, that specific type of coffee with the right settings that you like. So that's the idea behind edge computing and edge AI. The ability to have that type of algorithm running locally on the coffee machine, but still the ability to retrain that model in the cloud in case you've got new customers using that coffee machine. Another use case, which is a bit more, I think, what's happening in real life right now. So let's say you've got a model that you are using to classify dogs and cats. This model has been trained with data set, and now you want to add like the a new output that would be for horses. A way to do that, instead of, in, in fact, that would be the, the, the first option, and you just change the data set, and uh, you have like to like, like to, to the cats and dogs, you have pictures of horses. But that means that you need to retrain all the neurons that are in, your, uh, in, in that network. So in that case, for instance, it's 30 neurons. So it's not much, but in, in real life, in the network, it's more like millions of uh, neurons. So you, you just don't want to do that. So in real life, again, usually what you use is uh, transfer learning. So instead of retraining everything, you just go here. So the end of the network. So in our case, it's the last six neurons. So like you remove them completely, you put six brand new neurons, and you just retrain that part of the network. And it's just gonna learn to recognize horses in addition of dogs and cats. And that's the whole part of transfer learning. Why it's interesting with full metal update? It's because full metal update is able with OS3, of course just to update the differences between those two models. So if you just updated those six neurons, and let's say it's 50 kilobytes, just gonna update those 50 kilobytes. And if the overall size of your model was, I don't know, 20 minutes, just gonna update like that small part that was at the end of the network. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Networks like uh, LTM or IoT NB with limited bandwidth, or you might have to pay for the bandwidth, then you don't have that problem. I mean, it's not such a challenge anymore because you are just updating the differences. If we update the pipeline that was developed for full metal update, just to uh, the then what we did on that slide, we added, we added like an AI server. So, of course, you need infrastructure to train your AI models. I mean, you're not going to do that on you need, even for transfer learning, you need something quite powerful. Your new model and you add some horses. Then this model, you're going to use a container to execute it. And that's the beauty of uh, Fumet. Because we've got like years uh, with Yocto that you can use to install any type of um, machine learning frameworks. So you can have a container running TensorFlow 1.4 and next to it, another container running TensorFlow 2.3. And that's great because then it's solving all the dependencies because they are just executed in their own little world and they don't know, they might not even know about each other. So you don't, you will never run into some issues where basically you cannot run these two versions of TensorFlow together. It's a bit like a virtual environment in Python if you are a data scientist. Then you're gonna push like that container with the new version of the network to OS3. And that like the, the same process as one has described at the beginning. With OS3 computing for you, the differences between like the two uh, versions of that container. And with Hotbit, then you can trigger the update of the AI model to your embedded systems. So by using full metal update, you solve like three challenges that are coming with HGI. One of them was the pipeline to transfer new networks. 
It's kind of coming with a full metal update. Like we already provide you everything. You just need to plug your AI server in the build process. And with your auto, it's going to be automatically integrated in like the full metal update pipeline, like creating the containers and pushing everything to your embedded devices. The model size, because you are not transferring like the full size of the model anymore. You're just transferring the data between two versions of the model, thanks to OS3. So again, yet another problem which is not there anymore. Finally, dependency head. We are using containers. So you can put any type of dependencies in both small box, and then you can just uh, deploy them easily to your embedded systems. And you can use TBM, Armin, and TensorFlow, whatever you want. So uh, if you are looking for TBM and Armenon, for instance, at BTQ, we are providing a meta layer, which is called Meta Machine Learning, and you can just use it like out of the box uh, with full metal update. We already have examples and just test it. Time for a demo, talking about a nice demo with a classifier running on the STM32 and one And uh, so the beginning, the first part of the demo is going to be just with that classifier. So we just plug the camera and you can point that camera to pictures of dogs and cats or real dog or real cat. Update the model using a full metal update. And we add like horses. So we use transfer learning to uh, change the model, so to update the outputs basically with full metal update. For this second demo, we will see what happens when we update an inference model with full metal update. So as you can see, I still have my STM32 configured on Hogbit, and I have a third version of my container, including horse detection. I will deploy this distribution, this version of the distribution, and we will see what happens on the targets. So here you will see that the update will begin. And here you can see that the, uh, that the update started. And one very interesting point to note is the size of the update. As you can see, it's only 13 kilobytes, which is very, very interesting and is very a key point of OS3. It, uh, it enables very lightweight updates and you can actually update an inference model in this case with very little data. So now we will see what happens on the application. So here you can see a picture of a horse which is being filmed by the application and it's not able to detect the horse because it only has the cat and the dog detection enabled. Now we are going to proceed to the update. And now you can see that the container has restarted and in a couple of seconds a horse will be detected. So you can see that this update was quick and very lightweight, and it's really an interesting feature of Full Metal Update. Thanks, Cedric. Thanks, Antonin, for this presentation and the demo. Thank you uh, for this uh, complete presentation of Full Metal Update. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions or you need more information, feel free to contact us. We have type our email in the first slide that you can see in the video. You can follow us on LinkedIn. You can follow us on Twitter as well. We have the website www.witeq.com. And thank you, guys, everyone. Wish you a good day and see you soon. Mm -hmm.